In the wake of North Korea's latest ICBM launch, the South Korean government has added eight more North Koreans to the sanctions list, including the regime's intelligence bureau chief. The number of babies born hit a fresh low, dropping below the 20,000 threshold in October, accelerating chronic population concerns in South Korea. The Israel-Hamas war fuels worries over an escalation into wider regional conflict amid Houthis continuing attacks in the Red Sea and the U.S. striking against Iran-backed forces in Iraq. It's December 27, 2023. This is News Center. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yoon Jong-min. We begin with the South Korean government unveiling a fresh round of sanctions on North Korea in the wake of Pyongyang's re recent ICBM launch. The sanctions list included eight North Koreans, including the regime's spy agency chief, for their involvement in illicit weapons trade and cyber activities. Our defense correspondent Choi Min Jung reports. South Korea has slapped a fresh round of sanctions on North Korea in response to the regime's most recent launch of an intercontinental ballistic missile on December 18th. Seoul's foreign ministry announced Wednesday that it has targeted eight individuals. All eight were reportedly involved in generating profits for the North Korean regime and financing nuclear weapons and missile programs through illegal cyber activities and trading sanctioned materials, including weapons. Among those on the list is Lee chang -ho, the head of the regime's Reconnaissance General Bureau, also known as the organization behind North Korean hacking groups such as Kim Suki, Lazarus and Andariel. Lee is accused of gaining foreign currency and stealing technology through illicit cyber activities. Park yong han was also sanctioned for trading weapons-related goods on behalf of Korea Mining and Development Trading Corporation, North Korea's primary arms dealer. North Korean diplomat Yoon Chol reportedly traded lithium-6, a UN-prohibited nuclear-related item. The remaining listed individuals are affiliated with Pan Systems Pyongyang, an organization sanctioned by the South Korean government in 2016 and were involved in trading North Korean-made weapons. South Korea's foreign ministry also warned that Pyongyang's provocations would come with a price. It vowed to cooperate more closely with the international community, including the U.S. and Japan, to ensure that the regime realizes that it must stop its provocations and engage in denuclearization talks. With the sanctions now in place, those wishing to engage in financial transactions with these individuals must obtain permission from the governor of the Bank of Korea or the Financial Services Commission. The latest measures are the 14th round of sanctions to be put in place against Pyongyang since the beginning of the Yun administration. Since October last year, South Korea has targeted 83 individuals and 53 institutions. Choi min Dong, Arirang News. The economic activities and living environment of North Korean defectors here in South Korea have improved. That's according to a report unveiled by Korea HANA Foundation showing the employment rate of North Korean defectors this year stood at more than 60 percent. This is up more than one percentage point compared to last year and is the highest figure since the records were first compiled in 2011. Also, in a survey of overall satisfaction levels of living in South Korea, nearly 80 percent of the participants said they are satisfied, the highest rate ever. President Yoon song yeol made new vice ministerial appointments on Wednesday, continuing the wave of personnel changes in his administration ahead of the April general election. Career bureaucrat Kim yoon song was named second vice minister for economy and finance, known for his extensive experience in fiscal and budgetary policies. For the transport ministry, Jin Hyun-hwan was appointed as first vice minister to stabilize housing supply and welfare, given his experience in real estate state policies. Meanwhile, Song myung dal considered an all-around expert on maritime policy, marine logistics and fisheries, was named the vice minister for oceans and fisheries. Shin Young-suk, Yong former head of the National Human Resources Development Institute, became vice minister for gender equality and family. This comes amid continued uncertainty over the future of the gender ministry, which the president pledged to abolish during his electoral campaign. Yoon also named a new secretariat for the prime minister and the head of the public procurement service. 
Over in the Middle East, the continued attacks on Red Sea ships by Houthi militias and the U.S. strikes in Iraq are part of the latest development. That's renewing concerns of a wider regional conflict. Yi Sujin tells us more. Fears over the Israel-Hamas war escalating into a wider Middle East conflict are growing amid Houthi attacks and U.S. strikes. The Iran-backed Houthi rebel group, which controls a large part of Yemen, said on Tuesday local time that it launched missiles at an MSC United vessel in the Red Sea after the crew ignored three warning calls. Houthis has been attacking Red Sea ships since the start of the Israel-Hamas war on October 7 to both pressure Israel to end its war against Gaza and to prevent humanitarian aid from entering the Strip. In response, the Pentagon assembled an international naval coalition called Operation Prosperity Guardian to protect these ships. U.S. military forces also launched multiple airstrikes at three locations within facilities in Iraq used by the Iranian-sponsored militia Qatayib Hezbollah on Christmas night. In response to the drone attacks being carried out against U.S. personnel that left three of its service members injured. Meanwhile, the Israeli military says it's now preparing to shift its war operations from high-intensity fighting in Gaza to a low-intensity, long-term military action. The move comes as Washington has been calling on Israel to ease up on its heavy bombardment of Gaza and focus its attacks on Hamas infrastructure to limit civilian casualties. Israel Defense Forces Chief Herzi Halazi said Tuesday that its military is expanding its fighting in southern and central Gaza, adding that it is close to dismantling all Hamas battalions in northern regions. He said many Hamas soldiers and commanders have surrendered, with hundreds being held prisoner. However, he warned that the fight will last for many more months, saying there can be no shortcuts taken when dismantling an entire organization. This war has necessary and not easy goals to achieve. It takes place in complex territory. Therefore, the war will go on for many months and we will employ different methods to maintain our achievements for a long time. But the World Food Program warns that the humanitarian crisis in the Gaza Strip is worsening and that the region has now entered the so-called food crisis stage as the armed conflict in Gaza nears a three-month mark. Isujin, Arirang News. Twenty twenty three has been a year of conflict in many parts of the world. With a new war breaking out in the Middle East and the war in Ukraine entering its third year, hundreds of thousands of civilians have been killed or injured, and the world is now left with a greater threat to global peace. For more, we have our foreign affairs correspondent Peyunji in the studio to take a closer look at how these wars have changed the geopolitical landscape. Welcome, Indy. Thanks for having me. At first, let's start with the conflict between Israel and Hamas. It's already been almost three months since the recent fl flare up began in October. What kind of impact does this have on the Korean Peninsula? Well, the Hamas militant group launched an unprecedented surprise attack in Israel on October 7th, which stunned the country and killed hundreds of people. Now, this is a war that's happening thousands of miles away, but it could still affect the security situation on the Korean Peninsula. An expert says the conflict could pose a risk to South Korea, as much of Washington's focus is centered on the Middle East rather than North Korean threats. Already, the North Korean issue for the Biden administration and the United States as a whole as well, is not top priority at all. But because of this Israel Hamas war, the uh, North Korean issue is getting lower in the, uh, the list of the foreign policy. So it makes uh, some kind of negative effect to the Korean Peninsula. He added that at the same time, North Korea is using this chance to be more critical of the U.S. for supporting Israel. And it appears that the North is supporting Hamas. The Israeli military said about 10 percent of the weapons used by Hamas during its attack on Israel on October 7th were manufactured in North Korea. These security risks are especially concerning as they come at a time when the North has conducted five ICBM launches this year, the highest number in a single year. Moving on to the situation in Ukraine, uh, it's been almost two years since Russia's invasion. How has this affected the Korean Peninsula this year? Well, with the Ukraine war, North Korea has been able to make strategic moves and strengthen military cooperation with Russia. 
In September, the North leader Kim Jong-un even held a summit with Russia's Vladimir Putin, highlighting their strong cooperation. This sparked concerns of further arms deal between them, as it's widely believed that North Korea provided munitions to Russia and was given technology to successfully launch its first military satellite in return. Russia and North Korea have been building close ties, especially through their rare summit this year. Russia was supported with weapons and North Korea has been able to gain military technology. This transaction is how the Ukraine war has greatly impacted the situation on the Korean peninsula. The expert also showed hopes of a possible shift in the war next year, such as a ceasefire agreement. And speaking of ceasefire, Eunji, can we hope for the war to finally come to an end in the year to come? Possibly, yes. Putin has reportedly signaled that he is open to a ceasefire in Ukraine, far short of his recent message saying Russia will not give up what's theirs. Citing two unnamed former senior Russian officials, the New York Times reported that Putin has been signaling through intermediaries since at least September that he is ready to make a deal. It also said Putin earlier indicated that he was satisfied with Russia's captured territory and is ready for an armistice. Well, there's still no evidence that Ukrainian leaders who have pledged to re retake all their territory will accept this deal. But Putin's repeated interest in a ceasefire might put an end to the war that has lasted longer than expected. And it's important to see how the war ends, because if the war ends with Russia's occupation of Ukrainian territory, it will set an example of a country with nuclear weapons using its power to take over another country. This may have a very great negative impact on the Ukraine Peninsula because it is one of the cases the uh, powerful, especially the nuclear weapon country use their military power to invade the uh, neighbor's neighbor sovereign country. And this is exactly what North Korea has pursued for the past several decades. So both wars have definitely shown the dangers of how armed conflict can break into the region-wide combats. That's right. We'll just have to hope that next in the next year, these wars don't expand to a larger regional conflict. All right. Thanks for the wrap-up, Winji. Thank you. The latest monthly data on Korea's population is doing little to ease concerns over the country's birth rates. Our Moon hye has more on the numbers for October, which saw fewer than 20,000 babies. South Korea saw its birth rate plummet while the number of deaths rose, leading to a natural population decline in October. Data released by Statistics Korea on Wednesday show that the total number of births recorded came to just under 19,000 a decrease of more than 8 percent compared to the same month last year. It's the first time that this figure has dipped below the 20,000 mark for any month of October since data was first compiled in 1981. The number of deaths was also the highest for any October, coming to over 30,000, which is a 3.4 percent rise on year. The country has seen a natural decline in the population since November 2019, and October of this year was no exception. Natural decline is calculated by subtracting the number of deaths from the number of births, meaning a figure for October of 11,889. This is the biggest drop in the natural population for any month of October ever recorded. Meanwhile, the number of marriages rose compared to both the month before and October 2022. The number of registered marriages came to just under 16,000, which is a 1% increase on year and more than 3,000 more than September this year. According to a statistics Korea spokesperson, the reason for the rise is the fact that October has always been more popular than September for weddings. But July, August and September this year saw on-year declines unlike October. And the reason given for this was that the number of marriages saw a sharp rise in the second half of last year due to the easing of COVID-19 restrictions, meaning that the base value for last year was high. 
That being said, October this year saw an increase, and more observation will be needed over the coming months to see whether the marriage market is seeing a recovery or whether this is simply an anomaly. Meanwhile, the number of divorces also saw an on-year rise of 6%. Moon Haryan, Arirang News. Consumers this month believe prices will ease in the year ahead to 3.2%, which is the lowest in almost two years. Ian Jin with the details. The Bank of Korea released results of its consumer sentiment survey on Wednesday, which shows consumer inflation expectations have dropped this month compared to the month before, amid a downward trend in consumer prices. In December, expected inflation for the year ahead was 3.2 percent. That's down 0.2 percentage points from the previous month, marking the lowest figure in 20 months since April last year. The central bank poll also showed the Composite Consumer Sentiment Index, or CCSI, reversed a four-month downward streak that began in August. For December, the figure stood at 99.5, up 2.3 points from the previous month, still below the 100-point threshold, indicating that pessimists outnumber optimists. BOK officials say the improvement is due to a slowdown in rising interest rates amid hints that the cycle of U.S. Federal Reserve rate hikes has come to an end. The CCSI is used to gauge overall consumer sentiment, including for current living standards, prospective household income, and prospective spending, all of which are standardized. The central bank had expected inflation to reach a target rate of 2 percent by the end of this year, but now predicts inflationary pressure to continue into next year, with inflation expected to stay over 3 percent around the end of 2023. Ian Jin, Arirang News. South Korea beginning next year is investing one and a half trillion Korean won or around 1.2 billion U.S. dollars into ensuring the safety of workers as small sized businesses prone to serious accidents. This is according to plans the ruling People Power Party and the government announced on Wednesday. Related ministries and organizations will help over 830,000 small businesses conduct self inspections on safety. Further, South Korea will foster 20,000 and new safety management experts by 2026. The government and the PPP are advocating for a two-year delay in enforcing penalties on small site businesses that fail to comply with the Serious Accidents Punishment Act. This legislation was amended last year, but many small businesses still need to prepare to meet its requirement. The initial postponement of two years is set to expire in January. Starting next year, foreign national business leaders could be designated the so-called same person of conglomerates in Korea, meaning the chiefs of the companies following a rule change. Park Gonu explains. Starting from the first day of next year, Korea's Fair Trade Commission has announced that foreign nationals leading Korean conglomerates may be subject to regulation. These individuals, if designated as the same person, a term used for the chief or de facto leader of these conglomerates, will be held accountable under FTC rules. The same person is typically the chief executive of a conglomerate, with total assets exceeding 5 trillion Korean won as determined by the FTC. The purpose of this designation is to closely monitor corporate behavior and enforce rules against anti-competitive practices. Furthermore, the FTC plans to implement stricter regulations for companies under the same chief, particularly in their business and financial dealings. The latest amendment introduces four exceptional criteria that allow the FTC to designate a corporate entity as the same person responsible for a business group, even if a different individual is officially in charge. These criteria include the actual controller of the business group does not have an investment in its affiliated company, and the official chief's relatives neither invest in nor hold executive positions in an affiliated company. If any of the four conditions is not fulfilled, the FTC has the authority to designate an individual, including foreign nationals, as the same person responsible for the company. This started getting controversial after Coupang, the largest e-commerce platform in Korea, was designated as a conglomerate by the FTC in 2021, and the Coupang corporate body was designated as same person instead of the Korean-American head, Kim bom Sok. As he has U.S. citizenship, there were concerns that it is unfair under Korean law to other Korean persons because there were no precise regulations for those foreign nationals. But if the amendment gets implemented, it is expected that Kim will not be designated as the same person as he fulfills all of the four conditions. Park Gonu, Arirang News. 
South Korean actor Lee Seon-gyun from the Oscar-winning movie Parasite has died at the age of 48. Lee was found unconscious in his car by police on Wednesday morning in central Seoul. According to reports, police had earlier been made aware of a note which was described as similar to a suicide note at the actor's home. He had been facing an investigation over drug allegations since October and was interrogated by authorities for a third time on Saturday. He rose to global fame following the release of the movie Parasite in 2019. Marking its 20th anniversary, K-pop group TVXQ released an album for the first time in five years. The duo Yuno Yunho and Max Changmin dropped their ninth full-length album, 20 and 2, on Tuesday, the anniversary of their debut. The album features 10 songs, including the title track Rebel. The group will also hold a two-day concert at the Inspire Arena over in Incheon this coming weekend. Originally a five-member group, TVXQ became a duo in 2010 after the departure of three members amid a legal dispute over their contract with SM Entertainment. The last week of this year has been much milder than the norm. There are no worries about the cold tomorrow either. The morning will start at minus 2 degrees in Seoul. It will rise to 6 degrees, very similar to today. The maximum temperatures will exceed the previous year's temperatures by 3 to 4 degrees nationwide. For the time being, the mild winter weather will continue. Even though the cold wave has moved away, it is difficult to do outdoor activities. As the smoke from overseas flowed in and the atmosphere stagnated, fine dust is accumulating in the west. The concentration of ultra-fine dust in the Seoul metropolitan area in Chungcheongdo provinces and parts of the Jeollado provinces will be at bad levels. Wearing ultra-fine dust mask is very important when going outside. Tomorrow's Seoul and Daejeon will start off at minus 2 degrees Celsius. As for the daily highs, Seoul and Chuncheon will get up to 6, Gwangju and Daegu 10 degrees Celsius. Between the weekend and the last day of this year, rain or snow is in the forecast throughout the country, removing fine dust away. That's all for Korea. Here are the weather conditions around the world. That is News Center for tonight. Thank you for watching. A panel session coming up.